Thank you all for coming out. I know it's kind of wet out there, and now it's going to get cold out there. So uh, winter really is here. Um, I'm really thrilled, though, with uh, with actually all of the books that we're talking about tonight, though most uh, specifically Tehran Noir and Tehran at Twilight. And uh, I think you will have a chance, if, uh, if you haven't yet had a chance to read these books, we have them available after the program. But they give you a really different feeling for um, Tehran and, uh, you know, the kind of series that Akashic has put out on noir uh, fiction has been very, um, very interesting and kind of enticing in a particular way. And uh, we had one on Manila uh, about a year ago, and, uh, and we're thrilled to be able to uh, present these two books tonight. Um, and first, a, a big thank you to Akashic for uh, working with us. We're also uh, going to be presenting Eric Amalinda's The Descartes Highlands uh, on December 1st. So uh, if you want to get into yet another dark, steamy novel, um, come back to the Asia Society December 1st, and you can get into a, a whole other uh, realm of, of sort of psychological journeys, uh, which is what I think these books do, and they really do challenge you to um, think about the world in a slightly different way. Um, my name is Rachel Cooper. I'm the director of performing arts and cultural programs here, and uh, it's particularly special to me, though, that tonight is based on Tehran. Uh, we've done a lot here with... Uh, Iran, and it's been uh, now a year since we had Iran Modern, and since we uh, last had Salar Abdo here uh, on a program uh, breaking the stereotypes, um, looking at, at fiction. So it's, it's been too long, but we're going to uh, get into it. For those of you who are watching online, um, it's a beautiful starlit night here in New York City. <laughs> warm, balmy. It's actually rather rainy, and some of you may know that. And um, It's great that we can share this, whether you're here in New York City or, or somewhere else. I do want to let you know, when we get to the Q&A time, uh, you can send in questions, and we will monitor uh, online. And you just send them to moder moderator at asiasociety.org. So... Um, Without further ado, I'd really like to ask our two extraordinary speakers, um, Roya Hakakian and Salar Abdo, to come up. Um, both of them have books, have been involved with um, thinking about the, the kind of creative universe uh, of Iran over the last 30-some years and perhaps into the future, and uh, join us for the journey. So please give me a, a welcome for our speakers. Good evening. Um, I, I thought that either the power of his prose will draw you here, if not, uh, the pity that you might take on my broken arm. Either way, we'll take you as an audience. Uh, I, I met Salar uh, only six months ago, but it feels that it's uh, six months plus an eternity um, because um, we met and uh, it was an instant connection. Um, it has been one of the luckiest, most fortunate moments of my life to, uh, in a way, to find someone um, who feels as though I've always meant to know him, uh, but, you know, didn't have a chance. And uh, the reasons are many, uh, most of which uh, bring us back to the writer that he is and uh, uh, the way in which he has uh, gone exactly ahead and defeated uh, the forces of uh, 
what should have been or could have been uh, a tragic exile. Um, he could have been a character from the House of San Man Fog, but instead of being you know, yet another exile who can never uh, find a way to cast away bitterness, he ends up being a remarkable writer and, and a very prolific and productive one at that because in one month uh, he has come out with two books uh, at once. So uh, let's talk about how you've turned out to be, you know, so uh, prolific. And uh, tell us, you know, I think your own history is inseparable from the history of Tehran. Um, so tell us a little bit about who you were. I think, I think uh, many in this audience may already be aware that um, Salar comes from a very prominent Iranian family who actually had uh, a wonderful place in, in, in a city that no longer is in Tehran. And um, somehow uh, this uh, Salar, this son of Tehran, uh, has managed to witness the fall of that city and yet find his way back there again. Um, so this is, this is the return of Odysseus, no? You were driven out and then you've come back. Tell us about that journey. First of all, I want, can you hear me? Yeah. I want to thank my dear friend Roya. I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, her second book, I highly, highly, I, I recommend both of her books, uh, but in the second book especially, she writes an investigative uh, account of these assassinations that took place in the 90s uh, in, in Europe that practically changed uh, the way that European law looks at uh, acts of terrorism. And those were in Germany. So if you haven't read her second book of nonfiction, I highly recommend it. Okay. I'll get right back into the question Roya had. <clears throat> Obviously, I was born and raised in Tehran. Uh, in, a, in a family that uh, was... Uh, rather well known, my father, Ali Abdo. He, uh, he was many things. Uh, in Tehran Noir, I dedicate the book to him and to my son. And I dedicate it to, and I call him Tehran's old boss of bosses, which, because that's really how he was, but in the best sense of the term. Uh, like a lot of us who uh, experienced the revolution, uh, as a child, <coughs> I had to leave it with my family and come here. And uh, there were some difficult years for a lot of us Persians. And then I found my way back to Iran. It was a matter of choice. Very early on, I thought uh, I want to be a writer. And, uh, you know, we all have to find that place, which uh, that channel with which through which we do our writing, particularly if you live in North America and there's just so much of everything, you know, you, can't, you have to pick and choose your uh, interests. And obviously my interest was Iran, but more, even more so than Iran, the greater Middle East and its issues, its problems, its aspirations, its yearnings and its failures. So after, after college in California, I <clears throat> I went back to Iran and I lived there for a few years and uh, it was right after the war, the Iran-Iraq war. And that was the early 1990s. Yes, 1990 mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And I lived there for a few years and uh, you know I came back but uh, that new bond had stayed and it grew and uh, I, uh, as time wore on, uh, I joined my brother Reza Abdo, the theater director, uh, for a while, the last two, three years of his, before he died uh, in New York. And we lived together and we worked in Dara Luce, the theater company, with him. And then, uh, you know, I started writing and I started, again, going back to Iran regularly. And it sort of snowballed so that Iran. And then the greater Middle East became 
a sort of a second home to me and then in a way a first home and so that I'm there quite often you know at least twice a year for long stretches of time I have deep connections there and uh, so when Akashic uh, asked me to approach me with Tehran Noir, uh, about uh, the idea of Tehran Noir, uh, I really did feel like I was the right person for it. I had my hesitations about it, but, um, and I've spoken about those hesitations, and I speak about them in the introduction, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, I wasn't sure if the Persian writers in Iran would be able to pull it off. Because um, writing about the noir, that was my vision of the noir, meaning uh, I really wanted to stay focused on the city as it is today, and I wanted to um, focus on a, like the gritty realism of Tehran. I didn't want the writers to go all over the place write surrealistic stuff or magical realism. It, you, you talk about that really beautifully. I, I, um, I read the introduction mm. um, uh, at bedtime once, and then I thought, I really like this because I'm reading it really late at night when I'm at my weakest. <clears throat> I should try reading it in the morning again to see if I have the same feeling about it. And I read it again in the morning, and, and my admiration for that introdu introduction grew with every reading. And um, the reason is because I think you capture some uh, really important and really uh, great observations um, in, in just very few lines. Uh, it, the introduction is complete poetry in the way that, um, first of all, you're very magnanimous uh, about the way you look at Tehran without bitterness. Um, because it's very easy to, to be the son of the boss of bosses and, um, and return to Tehran without the boss himself or the luxuries that came with being the son of the boss of bosses. Uh, but aside from that, I, I also think that uh, your observations are very astute and, and quite terrific on many levels. And uh, going back to, um, to the writers, I love the way you summarize the problems of uh, most Persian prose mm -hmm. writers. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about fluffiness. Um, yeah. Because we, we, our justification has always been that there is censorship. And yeah. because of the censorship, there are certain things we can't say. But then the question always becomes, and has been for me, that if there weren't any censorship, are we really capable? of summarizing ideas in, in very straightforward, coherent, and, and uh, simple ways in the way that Strunk and White <laughs> would recommend that you do. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that kind of writing in Iran. And, and uh, the, the, uh, the excuse that we've had for it is, is mm -hmm. these are the ways in which we're trying to circumvent uh, the issue of censorship. So. Um, um, I, I think it's very important to, to hear from you uh, as someone who goes back and forth, unlike most of us, and, and has this amphibious existence on both continents, um, how you see writing here and how writers are writing there, mm -hmm. and um, what are the strengths and what are the shortcomings mm -hmm. um, in, in the way that they shape prose. It's a complicated issue, and all of the right questions you just asked. Um, uh, you know, a lot of books get published in Iran. Um, one of the new uh, uh, stati statistics that just came out, on, on an annual basis, three times as many books get published in Iran than the entire Arab world combined. That's a staggering number of books. And uh, so it's, the censorship exists. And it has its sinister uh, consequences in, in all ways at that people operate on the writer level, on the publisher level, on the translator level, and on the Ministry of Culture and Guidance level. And nevertheless, 
uh, Iranians are extremely uh, curious about the world, extremely curious, and it's a highly sophisticated country um, with, um, with an enormous college uh, participation, particularly on the side of women, a uh, highly educated population that seeks books, seeks knowledge, and the Internet age has really brought this, these new generations of young people into the world in a way that didn't even exist mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I used to talk to people. Uh, so all of these things exist, and that gives me hope. Nevertheless, uh, censorship goes back, as I talk about it in the introduction, it goes back to long before the Islamic Republic. It, it really does. And uh, I wasn't, I was too young to know about it, but as I speak with the people who were writers then and engaged in the life of literature, you know, during the Pahlavi regime, before the Islamic Republic, there was a different sort of censorship, and its, its sinister ways were different. And it worked on the writers on two levels. You had the censorship, the official censorship of the royal family, and then you had the censorship of the left, the, the, co the, the communist <laughs> intellectuals. Unless you wrote things that were in the service of the masses, you were against the proletariat, and then you weren't a writer. So, you know. You may very well be the first person who's put that in writing. Because we, we, we've always known that, you know, the second kind of censorship existed, but, but it was all hush hush because mm -hmm. nobody wants to uh, experience the wrath of the left. But you, you, you articulated it, and that was quite amazing. The wrath of the left, I feel, um, I don't want to, you know, dwell on it too much because yeah. it's a whole subject for especially me and you. But <laughs> the wrath of the left was truly, I word the, I, I, use the word sinister, but it was truly sinister, uh, far more than uh, what the Pahlavi regime engaged in, I feel. Nevertheless, um, the, with the Islamic Republic, uh, other, other sorts of censorship came into being, which I talk about in the introduction, and sometimes real absurdities, you know, like, you know, the, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, not being able to describe Forget about a sex scene, but you know the, the most innocent, innocuous human uh, relationships. Sometimes even a glance is too much. So you know, under these circumstances, it's really hard to be a writer. It's really hard to uh, to write. Uh, lately, in in the past few years, I've begun to write articles for ir for Iranian journals, and you know. Even I, as, an, as someone who is living here, uh, sitting in New York City writing an article that's going to be published in Tehran, I have to think about what the censor is going to think about sure. this sentence. And actually, it's happened that you know, a, a write an article, a totally innocent article I wrote at the last minute uh, doesn't get published. So when I think about uh, the the difficulties I have so, so far and removed from that, I, I think about the writers, the writers in this book, for instance, what they have to go through. So what's happened, uh, to make a long story short, is all of this comes together and makes it so that uh, the writer in, in a place like Iran uh, has to uh, figure out a way to write so they can get published. And, uh, so official censorship, in, a, in essence, becomes self-censorship. Official is censorship becomes self-censorship, and also uh, the publisher themselves <laughs> becomes the, another shield of censorship, because if the publisher publishes something that the ministry is not happy with, they can shut you down. Right. So the you know so the publisher becomes really really you know becomes wary of what they right. publish or not. So you know so in that atmosphere, what happened was that 
Iranian writers in the past decades, and again, I think this goes back to even before the revolution, they engaged in certain things. Um, you know, uh, this is sort of taking some of the lesser, <coughs> uh, some of the lesser achievements of magical realism or surrealism or uh, or sort of very innocuous, uh, the, the uh, descriptive everyday existence that really doesn't have a plot line or nothing really much happens. All of this becomes grist for what they write about and to me it's tedious. Um, and then what happens on top of that, uh, we don't have a, uh, we don't have this sort of uh, critical culture that exists here. So there is criticism but it's not developed mm -hmm. as it is here. But people are very intelligent, they're highly educated, so they find ways to rationalize what they're doing. Um, for instance, what they do in, you know, in criticism, they'll take, they'll, they'll conveniently do misreadings of Ru Russian formalism that mm -hmm. talks about, you know, only the text and nothing outside of the text, which basically boils down to don't talk about politics, don't talk about history, only the text. And then, you know, the the mm, what I call the lesser aspects of the French Nouveau Roman. Mm -hmm. All of that comes together, converges to make for a really watered down literature. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have this uh, explosion of talent, and that's what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how I can extract, like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you know, basically like uh, you know, there's a bird in a cage, and you open the cage, but the bird is, has a fear to fly, sure. and that's what I was engaged in. So it was a fascinating process to actually okay. do, and I went beyond the well-known writers. I, I really, as I've said before, I cast my net wide, and it truly paid off. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, when we were sitting in, in together a few minutes ago, I said that all of us who are Iranian-American writers uh, living here, um, uh, deal with the issue of Iran and the desire to return in one way or another. Um, it, some of us decide that eh, it's not a place I want to return to anyway and, and uh, go on trying to take on other subjects. Uh, some of us, like you, um, actually do physically return. So I, I wonder what it's been like for you to be the Iranian in America and the American in Iran. How do these identities live um, and are perceived on, on, in these two completely different spaces? And um, mm. what, you know, what are the reactions in Iran and, and how, do you, um, what are, how do you reconcile um, uh, the, no. the misconceptions here? And what are the misconceptions anyway? Uh, I could talk about that for <laughs> thousands of years. I, I, won't, I won't get into it too much. Uh, what happens here, being a Iranian, is that uh, the misconceptions are one part of the thing. The other thing is just uh, this reductiveness and simplistic way of looking at what a place is. Not, not because people are bad or they want to look at Iran that way. Oftentimes it's just that it's really hard to know a place unless you spend a lot of time there, lots and lots of time there. Mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if you go there for two months or even two years and then write a memoir about Iran, uh, that's okay, but you know, about you know having to wear a veil or you know having to, whatever. It's it's okay, but to really know a place you, you, and the layers, the textures of it, and especially a very complicated society like Iran, you really have to be there for a long, long time and really engage with various levels of society. So, uh, what happens here is that. I find myself uh, looking at 
how Iran is perceived, the sorts of books that get published about it, the sorts of films that come out about it. And uh, they lack nuance, mm -hmm. they lack sophistication, and they, uh, they uh, serve a certain way of looking at a place which is, you know, once removed from being in the cave, you know. Mm -hmm. So for a writer like me, when I, when I find myself looking at this, I become removed. You know, I, I sort of, I don't give up, but I almost give up mm -hmm. because I feel myself out of the central discourse of American culture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, like f you, for instance, are far more engaged than me because your, en your energy is so much more than me, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I follow your articles all the time and your essays. But for me, it's just, it's almost an element of, being heartbroken because I know that it's, uh, it's a wonderful yeah. state to be in. Heartbrokenness yeah. comes with with being a writer. It, yeah. it feeds the beast. It helps. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, and then it, in Iran, um, in Iran, and you know that's how I write my novels. I mean, Tehran at Twilight is kind of like that. It's mm -hmm. the protagonist is. What, did, what do they not get about you mm -hmm. in Iran? I'm yeah, very now, now curious. Now I'm moving about yeah. Iran. What's interesting about Iran is this. Uh, after the Islamic Republic and through these years, and uh, what, what happened to this society is that people withdrew into, the, into their interiors, literally. And what that does is, let's say, the intellectual class, the writers, the art artists, and I've had this discussion with them, and they don't like to hear it. <laughs> I tell them, you know, I come to Tehran, and within a week, you know, I scoot around with my motorcycle. It's the only way to really get around in that city, because it's mad, and the that traffic is... is so cool. Yeah. And, you know, and these, I tell them, you know, you guys, uh, you only see each other. You only go to each other's parties. You have no idea what's going on below, let's say, Jomhuri Avenue in Tehran. Uh, and uh, how, can you, how can you write about a society you know nothing about? So you, you, know? you see their insularity. You see... I see their insularity, and then, you know... I, I don't want to generalize to all of them because mm -hmm. some of them are great guys and, you know, uh, and they're doing their best, like some of the people, all of the people. This is just this between piece. us, of course. Yeah. You, can, you can feel free to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's why I went after these guys. But, right. You know, then what happens is, you know, when I make this criticism to my friends, they say, well, you know, you don't really live here, so how can you know? But... So are you a half Iranian to them? Are you, are you less Iranian? Are you a, um, a, a suspect Iranian? I'm a suspect Iranian because I'm more Iranian, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but to move into this, uh, I don't know, did I answer that question? Or yeah. Kind of? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but one more thing about that question is, so you have... In Iran, you have these pockets, these islands of human beings that are not necessarily in touch with each other. You have the, you have truly, you have an intellectual class that does, does is not interested in the society they live in because, um, because it gets them into trouble. It gets them into trouble. Some of them have become depressed and they just have removed themselves from society. The best people They're heartbroken. They're heartbroken. And then I think I talked about it right here a year ago. And then in an atmosphere such as that, where let's say somebody who is talented and amazing, e either as a translator or a director uh, or a writer, and they don't, want to, they don't want to have to deal with, let's say, censorship, so they remove themselves from the discourse the way I sometimes remove myself from the discourse here. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is it allows, it opens the door 
for what I, opportunists, let's be frank about it, to move in and to sort of take over the discourse, which is not much of a discourse at all. It's kind mm -hmm. of a bland, you know, just being in the public eye. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so that's why I went after people who are, I thought, they really know the city. Mm -hmm. They're right, either they're writers who have something to say, uh, or they're journalists who have something to say, or they're people with intense experiences. Uh, and those are the people I saw. And, and I, I thought it was staggering the yeah. way in which almost every story that has been in the headlines was in one shape or form included in one of these stories. You know, the stoning of women, uh, the, uh, or hangings, and uh, the anxiety of political activists, reporters, everything that mm -hmm. we see on a daily basis in newspapers uh, is somehow uh, embedded in one of these stories. Do you want to read a piece? Um, I think it would be hard to read a piece, but I can read a page and a half of the intro, if you like, if, if, yes. that, if you're good yes. with that. I think so. <clears throat> I'll just read it a little bit because it would. So, uh, this is from the introduction, and I, the introduction is called The Seismic City uh, because Tehran sits on a fault line and it's supposed to one day disappear from the face of the earth. So, that's where we live. Back in the day, so my mother tells me, on the rare occasions when my father took her along to one of the cabarets of old Tehran, the tough guys, the lutis, the bosses, the knife brawlers, and the traditional wrestlers would lay out their suits and jackets on the floor of the place for my mother to walk on. It was a gesture of supreme respect for one of their own, and it says a lot about a Tehran that simply doesn't exist anymore a Tehran of chivalry and loyalty, a place where allegiance has meant something, where friendships hark back to a classical world of warriors from the great Persian epic, the Book of Kings, and to the medieval Islamic notion of the Ayyar Brotherhood in Iran and Mesopotamia, where the bandit and the common folks champion were one and the same, and where every man followed a code of honor set in stone. Or else, all of this may simply be wishful nostalgia for something that didn't exist even way back then. Back then means a time before the Islamic Revolution of 79, that watershed event that sits in the mind of every Iranian as a chasm, a sort of year one after which everything strange became law. The brutal eight years of war with Iraq, the longest conventional war of the 20th century, the persistent pressures from America in its own everlasting twilight war with Iran, the official corruption of the new ruling class, and the snowballing inflation turned just about everyone into a, quote, night worker. Living an honest life was no longer an option. Prostitution, theft, an explosion in the drug trade and addiction, the selling off of raw materials and historic national treasures, plus endemic, in-your-face bribery became a way of life. Meanwhile, Tehran grew and grew until it was one of the megacities of the world, now pushing at 15 million stray souls, a leviathan that can barely stand itself, a purgatory of unmoving traffic, relentless pollution, and noise and anger and iniquity, surrounded by some of the most beautiful mountain scenery in the world. Tehran, then, is a juxtaposition of ugliness and beauty that breaks the heart, a place where not one but two inept dynasties came to miserable ends and where, arguably, the third most important revolution in history after the French and the Russian was started. It is also the city where Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt met up, met to divvy up the world while the flames of World War II were still burning and it was where one of the CIA's first manufactured coups with the prodding and support of the British, who else, against a democratically elected government was put into motion, thus ushering in years of a dictatorship, which in turn was swept aside 
by the first real fury of fundamentalist Islam, a harbinger of the world we now live in and call post 9-11. The intro is longer, but I wanted to, yeah. Um, I, I want to quickly get to, to the novel, although I think we've touched upon um, some of the fundamental uh, issues that, that go into the making of it. Um, but <clears throat> it, here in Tehran at uh, Twilight, you do what you do best, which is foreshadow events to come. You did that prior to 9-11, and you're doing it again in Tehran at twilight. Where do you get, where do you get those powers from? Uh, in, in what makes you so wonderful at seeing things that are in the making? I don't know if it makes me wonderful, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'll take the thing, but um, I, think one, I think there's a couple of things. I really follow geopolitics but I try not to get bogged down in too many details. Mm -hmm. I think what happens with a lot of uh, experts in Washington, whom you know well, you know, I think they get bogged down and they, they Does don't... Does anybody know the experts yeah. in Washington, really? But yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's good to be able to pull back. Sometimes you can see the greater uh, tectonic shifts in, his, in history and what might happen if you don't get bogged down in the minutiae of everyday situations. What happened? I mean, Tehran at twilight, as I wrote in my author's statement, it, it's really the last of a trilogy for me mm -hmm. that began with the poet game, <coughs> continued with opium, and then I really finished it with this. The poet game was the, the approach to the terror wars of the 21st century, mm -hmm. opium was its beginning and middle, and Tehran twi at twilight is truly its twilight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, what happened with the poet game, uh, I started becoming interested in the issues that are the issues of the world today. In, in the late 80s when I was in college, mm -hmm. I was in the Middle Eastern studies in Berkeley and and I started seeing a pattern uh, in, uh, in the people I went to school with and uh, converts, people who were interested in Islam. Uh, there was a pattern that I began to see that I knew one day I would write about it. And then when I wrote The Poet Game the, uh, a couple of years before 9-11, the, the literary, the, the theme, the main crux of the novel was about um, these people are sent from the Middle East to, it was a, it was a straight up, it was a literary thriller, but far more of it. The first two books of this trilogy were far more genre books. This is far more literary. But the, the conceit of it was that uh, they're going to blow up some buildings in New York City in order to pull United States into a long protracted war into the Middle East. And so when uh, this happened, and actually the day it happened, I happened to be right underneath the World Trade Center, um, people started thinking <laughs> I'm some kind of a, you know, I have some powers of... Oracle. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a little difficult to, to that period of my life was actually because I, I had to be, you know, on display. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, by then, I had already started... On display, you mean the media contacted you yeah, and asked you yeah, to comment? Yeah, like, I, 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 you know, it was like being some sort of an expert that I really wasn't, but, mm -hmm. it, you know, you can get lost in this thing unless... Sure. And I pulled myself out of it quickly and went into <laughs> another one of my heartbreaks. <laughs> but, but uh, and then by then, I had already started opium. You mean you said no to CNN? Well, the, oh dear. yeah, I was like, somebody wanted that to be like their unique. Iran expert. I'm not, I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't even know myself. You know? <laughs> and then, um, then by the time I wrote Opium, by the time I published it, I had, uh, the war had not even began in Afghanistan. And again, the conceit for Opium was that this guy had been fighting, who had gone to Afghanistan in the 80s to 
to fight against the Russians. And then over there he becomes involved in the heroin trade. And uh, so I felt like I was always one step ahead or, be, or behind or racing against, neck and neck with, uh, with, uh, with the events of the day, which, which can be interesting, but it, it can also be exhausting. Mm -hmm. And it, it made me have to actually rewrite opium completely because, you know. Uh, then when I came to Tehran, Tehran at twilight, I really s sat on it for many years because I wanted to know where we were going. And I wanted to write a truly literary psychological novel. So, uh, the other novels were literary, but they didn't, they didn't deal intensely with the psychology of what it means to what it means to become for instance a terrorist what what it means to in this novel there are three main protagonists one of them is uh, Malik who is a professor in a university in New York very much like myself and he's had many contacts with the Middle East. He's been an interpreter for journalists, and and he's you know he does not feel like he quite belongs here. His loyalties are divided. Nevertheless, he's chosen to be here and make his livelihood here. The Sina, the guy, uh, he his best friend from uh, from college in California, goes back to Iran and becomes an intense and rabid anti-American that does everything he can in Iraq and Afghanistan to, to, uh, to get in the way of uh, Americans and you know, gets caught up with really bad people over there and he asks for Malik's help. And then the third person is, uh, is an American former Marine Captain James, James McGravy who uh, who fought, he's, a, he's an idealistic man. He's like, for me, he's the best of what America can, offers to the world. He's, he loves his country, he's a patriot, but he's not blind. He, he really questions the execution of the wars. And then he ends up writing a book about it that's, you know, that uh, uh, questions a lot of the things that his commanders did. So the, so the, the novel is, is sort of the dynamic between uh, these three people. And as usual, as I forgot what the question was. I do this every time. <laughs> oh, sorry. That, that you, you wanted to talk about um, your ability to foreshadow, but also oh, yeah. um, I guess b b at least the first two characters you talk about are various versions of Iranians in diaspora. You know, those are... Yeah. And yeah. Malek is, is very much you, and Sina is someone who chooses to return and um, yeah. gets involved with the wrong There are crowd. aspects of myself, actually, but, and many people I've, I know, and many people I've worked with in the mm -hmm. field. You know, the, a lot of this, a lot of the flashbacks of this novel do take place, particularly in Iraq, particularly in... Uh, in uh, in Cor northern, uh, northern Iraq, Kurdistan. So yeah, again, uh, when this book came out, uh, and then, uh, then ISIS um, really broke through. In, uh, I, I was actually in Iraq when ISIS broke through uh, with my partner, who is a war journalist. And, uh, and again, once again, I felt like in my life, I had, you know, my interests had sort of converged with what's happening in the world. And it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just seems to be something I do, at least in these three books. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm going to go in a different direction now. But I felt like I needed three books to really complete. I needed a trilogy to really un try to understand, wrap my mind around a subject that as a college student, really, it really started to uh, it really started to become my issue. I would say in 1987, as a as a very young man, I, I started to see it. I knew one day I would write about it, and I knew one day this would become the issue of the mm -hmm. world. I, I just knew it. Right. So, so I find it incredibly interesting that someone who insists on. Um, 
defining himself as an apolitical writer, mm. um, deals with these subjects and chooses to go to places that I don't dare go. Salar is about to take off for Iran and then subsequently for Iraq. So uh, it, this is incredibly interesting. And I think, uh, if anything, it speaks to the complexities of, of the issue of uh, being a hyphenated uh, Middle Eastern in America today, that, that um, uh, many subjects that <laughs> we really don't want to write about uh, somehow, one way or another, uh, get to be part of our discourse and show yeah. up in our work despite our best yeah. uh, interests. Yeah. Um, I, I think we should stop here to open up the conversation to, to our uh -huh. very patient and wonderful audience. Uh, but do you want to read a passage before we do that? I'll read a quick passage okay. if you like. If it's That's okay, great. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Very much okay. okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I chose a passage for tonight uh, that's in the middle of the book, and I have to just make a quick explanation. I wrote the note just before I came here. Um, uh, so, I decided to read tonight from a section from the middle of Tehran at tw Twilight, and it's very brief. It's a short section that actually takes place in New York City rather than the Middle East. And it's a moment in a bar where the protagonist, Reza Malek, who for years worked as a translator during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, sits down with his friend, James McGravy, an idealistic former Marine captain who did tours of duty in those places. This is a brief scene between Malek and James. There is also an important place name to know about this section, and that place is in Iraq and is called Fallujah, a city in Iraq where the American Marines fought two, two of the most bruising, bruising battles of not just Iraq, but US Marine history. James has actually written a book on his experiences of the war, and not in a good light. Also, a couple of other names that are mentioned here are Clara Vikingstadt, an ambitious American journalist who Malek once worked for in the Middle East, and also just briefly a young woman named Candace who is now James's girlfriend. So this, this is the context, and they're in this bar. A Spanish bar with the unlikely name of Katz sat a block away from the Jamaica Center subway. It was a few minutes' drive from JFK Airport, and at night it filled up with Central American laborers. It, it was also where Malik first stopped whenever he had to fly during the past couple of years. But this time, James had insisted on driving him to the airport. Now, a dozen empty shots of tequila and several beers sat between the two men. In front of them, on a beat-up dance floor, a man with an outsized cowboy hat was desperately trying to get the waitress to dance with him, while the jukebox played some aching south-of-the-border tune. And of all the things Malek could have recalled at that moment, he went back to the Kabul nights in the wealthy Vazir Akbar Khan district, where you could drink yourself to an inch of your life at those wild parties under the auspices of one of the coalition embassies. While not five blocks away, Afghans died of everything you could possibly die of, including the freezing weather and hunger and disease and roadside bombs and guns and knives and heroin and lack of heroin and just plain good old-fashioned Afghan payback. It was a screwed up, unjust world. And when a guy sat down in the Vazir Akbar Khan district to drink, drink himself into a stupor, he either did it because, like a lot of those embassy paper pushers, he couldn't care less, or because he simply didn't want to dwell anymore on what was happening five blocks away to his right and left. A man wanted to sit there while foreign whores served him Indian beer and Canadian whiskey so he could forget that Clara Vikingstadt was up there in a warm room interviewing some UN apparatchik for the hundredth time about how awful war could get. Malek thought, if this Mexican joint at the dog end of Queens could bro brought him back to the Kabul of a few years ago, only God knows 
would know what James McGravy was thinking, because the former soldier had to be thinking of something too, maybe something as ordinary as there was no way on earth he was going to drive anywhere after all the booze they'd had. And I was fine with Malik. James could sit here and piss till he was sober enough, and Malik would just ride the train the rest of the way to the airport and get on that plane and fly to Tehran. Then Malik simply blurted out over the music what had been on his mind all the evening. Have any of your own soldiers read your book? James turned to regard Malik. His eyes were bloodshot, but more from fatigue than alcohol. Both of Candace's boys had come down with the flu, and James had not had much sleep for the past few nights. McGravy nodded his head. Yes, his soldiers had read the book, he seemed to say, and no, he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about that because, because it was still too new, and because there were those under his command who had probably thought of him as some kind of prophet and others who detested his particular brand of heroism. It was all in the book anyway. He'd never questioned the bravery of his men, but he had rubbed salt in their wounds because Fallujah had been no Iwo Jima. He had stuck to his guns about that. And for decades henceforth, the men who had served with him would get heartburn every time James McGravy's name came up. Not because he might be telling the truth, but because he had infused a kernel of doubt in their marine hearts, mm. the poison of uncertainty that made each of them wonder if their valor had ever been worth anything. Mm. I just want to add about Fallujah, right after the American, last American soldiers left Iraq, it fell back to Al-Qaeda affiliates almost immediately, and it continues to do so. Go ahead. Well, um, perhaps one last question which, which I want to ask, um, so I'll be the first uh, audience question, which is um, um, you, you might very well be, at least as far as I'm aware, um, the first Iranian-American writing in English who has been very sympathetic uh, to the, the issue of Jews in Iran and the history of contemporary Jews in Iran. Um, and some of that uh, manifests itself in, in Tehran at twilight. Um, since we are in New York, uh, <laughs> I can't help but ask, uh, where does that come from, and um, and how do you account for uh, this uh, amazing, unprecedented streak in in your writing? And I think the story that you write about is wonderful. So, if you want to uh, summarize it a bit. Um. Um, okay, that's a great question. A few years ago, my my colleague and I, I have an Israeli colleague at City College of New York whose father and aunt were what are called Yaldai Tehran, the Tehran children. These were uh, Polish Jewish children who escaped uh, Poland when the Nazis invaded. They spent about two years in the gulags of Stalin. And after incredible hardship, they ended up in Tehran. They were saved, and they went to what was then Palestine. It was a story that we had to work on, and that's my next book, actually, the next book of nonfiction with my colleague. And I couldn't help but actually bring it into my novel, and I did. So that's another theme in the novel, that uh, as I was researching it, I became in extremely intrigued by the whole uh, the whole notion of Persian Jewish uh, history that, you know, goes back 2,500 years. I mean, it goes back to the book of Daniel. It goes back to Mordechai and Esther. It goes back to the book of Ezra. And, you know, as I started to read this stuff, I, I realized that, I mean, I knew it, but, you know, sometimes you just, you have to really dig deep and understand that, History is beyond today, you know, and the last 30 years. 
So that was, uh, that was one thing that happened to me. But the other thing that happened was, and uh, this came up the other day, I was uh, in a panel actually, uh, Tehran Noir, Tel Aviv Noir at New York Public Library. And I didn't talk about it, but I can talk about it now. Uh, I, you know, I, I was trying to convey that you know, people see Iran in a certain light, in a certain way, and, you know, uh, there's a, every, every, every few months, there's this pattern, uh, there will be a sort of a hint of a rapprochement with Iran, and then there will be a leak. And then, because of the leak, somebody high up in Iran will say no. Well, they will say something extremely anti-Semitic or anti-Israel or anti-America. And then the whole house falls down. And I want to say that that's one narrative of Iran. And it's undeniable. And, you know, I don't want to rationalize anything. But, but I call it smokescreen. Because, because the go. bigger, better more interesting and deeper, more complex Iran is behind that uh, smokescreen. And this is the more complex and nuanced Iran. 30 feet away from my apartment in Tehran is the Chaim Synagogue, whose picture Which I've came sent up, you. Uh, yes, in, in, um, in your first email to me, you, you yeah. sent an attachment yeah. of the view of the synagogue. On any given Saturday, they'll call me, the congregation, so actually, they call me professor, <laughs> and you know, come break bread with us, you know, after Sabbath, and I go there and. Do they ask you to turn the lights on or not? You know, these guys. I think they're <laughs> actually they're like they're because there's another congregation that's You are the Orthodox, Shabbos boy after all. <laughs> they they seem not to follow the rules too closely. You know. <laughs> I know. But anyway, they'll. they'll it's Iran. We break the rules all the time. The door of the synagogue is open all day on Saturday. Anybody can move in and out. And like the last time I was there and you know, I live I live in a really working class part of Tehran. All of my my neighbors are taxi drivers, clerks. Um, they're very they're religious. And I was at the synagogue breaking bread with them. And I saw my neighbor, this lady from the provinces, you know, who wears the chador. And I s turned to these two guys who are my friends, and they fix my motorcycle. And I said, what's, what's my neighbor doing here? What's she doing here? <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah, she, she had this problem that she couldn't fix. So she came here one day and said, pray for me. And we prayed for her. And her problem went away. <laughs> <laughs> and now we can't get rid of her. <laughs> and, and it was, you know... It, was, it didn't work for me when I was a kid. I went to synagogue. You have to come Maybe to my synagogue. Maybe it just synagogue. works for non-Jews. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, it was like... That's just, you know, I don't want to make Iran seem like a fairy tale or the most perfect place because it's not. God knows there's so many issues, there's so many problems. And tomorrow we may wake up and in the news there'll be some another, somebody will have said another horrible thing. But the tr thing I was trying to convey is, I don't say his name anymore, but the guy who was, because he's a material to me, but the guy who was the, the Holocaust denying guy who was around for eight years. Two, two. He is, he's so nothing to me that he was, he's a rodent, and I don't say his name. But there's a, you know, I want to say you can't put all of us in one. You know, there's a difference between him and the president we have now. When the guy gives half a million dollar to the dollars to the Jewish hospital, there is a Jewish hospital in Tehran near my house. When the guy gives half a million dollars, you know, he might have done it for various reasons. It might be just to, you know. Uh, but he did that instead of denying the Holocaust. So there is a difference. And that's what I'm trying to say. You know, I think there are many parts of Europe today that you couldn't have the synagogue door open all day without 
serious for this. That's, I protection. think this is a beautiful place to actually you know, um, end and, yeah. uh, because I think uh, the, you are very beautifully put the notion of the complexity of Iran um, and the ways in which people turn out to be uh, incredibly enterprising, capable despite the circumstances and, and incredibly creative. Um, you say in the introduction that Tehran is a place of impermanence, which, uh, which it is. And I think you also um, just now um, beautifully put the notion that um, despite all the, all the fighting that goes on and we see in the newspapers, uh, there is still a real dialogue. And I think to, to confirm what you just said, um, it, it might be very interesting for, for some of our audience members to, to look at the uh, most recent report on the survey of, uh, that Anti-Defamation League did on around the world. It's a global index on anti-Semitism. And in the entire Middle East and North Africa, Iran was the least anti-Semitic place. So I think... And you've uh, written about that. Because I, I yeah, do, that is a and I'm, issue. you know, I, I don't go to Iraq or to Iran, and, and I end up being the political one, <laughs> but you do all the traveling, and, and you, you, so, so I think we, we all end up doing the same thing in uh, one way or another, and uh, have the same preoccupations, and one way or another we try to tackle uh, the monster, uh, which is the heartbreak of leaving Iran and trying to deal with the remnants. So uh, on that note... Um, also what we try to tackle yes. is this white and black notion mm -hmm. of what Iran is, what Israel is, what Muslims are, what Shiites are, what Jews are. You know, we try to, you and I and all of the people of our milieu, mm -hmm. we, try to, we try to understand the nuances, we try to understand the layers within. Without that, what are we? Right. Thank you for being here. Yes. So, question. How, how does such censorship really work? What's the process? Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cut and dry. You, you, you write your thing and then you submit it to the uh, Ministry of Guidance and you know it's either rejected you know they'll just reject it all their they'll uh, mark it up and they'll say these are the issues they call them issues and then you go in there and you like talk to them it's, it's like haggling you know and uh, then uh, you, depending on who you are and what you want to do with your life as a writer, you accept it, you take it back, and you try to fix these issues, and you resubmit it. And sometimes this process can take uh, years and years. In the past year, ever since President Rouhani came, uh, there has been a flood of new books in the market because they just wouldn't let anything get published. Uh, and uh, so there's been a definite improvement, but really it can take years sometimes. People's books can sit on the back burner for years while, you know, that this issue has to be fixed, that issue has to be fixed. And it really is demoralizing to writers. I, you know, some of the writers I know, a couple of the writers in Tehran Noir who actually came here for fellowships this past year, and they experience not having to work with censorship because I commissioned these stories from scratch. There were stories that had not been written. And I told them, look, you can write anything you want. So once, I think once you experience that freedom, it's really hard to go back and work in, within that framework again. And many writers have told me they just can't do it anymore. So it depends on the it depends on the person, but that's the process. It's a it's a long, 
continuing process where you're cold in, you have to haggle for it, and you don't hear anything for a long time, and then suddenly, voila, they'll, you know, they'll anoint you, they'll let you publish, or they won't. But I think the, the most important uh, comment, perhaps, to emphasize, as he said before, is that it's become self-censorship, so writers themselves know what can pass and what can't. So they do the, they're the first line of uh, self-censorship, and then their editors and publishers uh, are the second, and then the third would be governmental censors who officially look at these things. I mean, I experience this myself in my articles for Tehran all the time. Like, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I just have an article coming out in a month about, about a biographer, and he's written about many things. And uh, I interviewed him, and uh, I, I told him that, you know, I, this is for Iran, and there are some places I won't go, you know, more or less, and he was okay with it. But he's written at length about being gay and gay issues. And so I just didn't go there, because I knew that there would not let the article get published and the Iranian readership would be the poorer for it. If I were writing that article here, other books of his, besides his biographies, uh, of Flannery O'Connor and John O'Hara and all that, I would, I would cover those books. But because of Iran, I had to focus on these books. And as a writer and as a journalist in this case, I have to question myself, you know, every time. I, I, I wonder, is this right, what I'm doing? Uh, sh should I not present the totality of this writer's life and world and his, uh, his pre preoccupations with the world? And, you know, every time, every time I write something for Iran, I have to think about these things. And it's an in it's intense pressure because you know, every time you make a move, you, you're, war you're wondering if you're being true to the world and yourself, or you're not. Um, I have a question about Tehran. I have a question about Tehran Noir. Uh, specifically, I'm interested in knowing whether you perceive a difference in the writer's approach to the noir genre. Uh, between Iranian writers and Western writers in general? Do you, is there a visible or palpable difference in their approach to the genre? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's, there's a, I've read a lot of these international noirs uh, that Akashic puts out, and I highly recommend them. And every country, every city is very different. There's definitely a there's a, definitely a flavor to North American noir, to American noir, that's actually different than, let's say, Western European noir. Uh, uh, these, these writers, I, these particular writers, I had to shepherd them into the sort of hardcore realism that I was after. If I hadn't shepherded them, it would not have happened like this. So. I actually push them to my notion of what noir is in the classical sense, in the classical sense. And one of those, one of those uh, notions, the core notion of the noir is that you don't really have a hero in a, in a noir story you have an anti-hero, you have, the noir has failure, you know, if, if it's not a failure, it's not a noir story, it's not a detective story, it's not a whodunit story, it's not even a hard-boiled story. It's, it's, a, it's a frame of reference where every move you make uh, brings you a notch down towards uh, annihilation. So I, I, I went for that because I, I thought if I shepherd them towards that, they'll bring the best stories that Te Tehran has to offer, because Tehran is a city that's 
filled with these stories that never get written because of censorship, because writers have gotten used to not talking about it. And when you go through these stories, you see, uh, you see a country that's filled with all sorts of issues. One of them, for instance, then you see, you see the intense chauvinism of Persians against the, their neighbors. You see, you see their uh, prejudice against the Arabs, against the Turks, against the Afghans. You see it in story after story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something we can't hide. Why are we so chauvinistic? And why don't we ever write about it in our stories? But it comes out in these stories again and again. And also the vocabulary of it, you see that uh, the vocabulary, it's an Islamic country with many uh, minorities, but a lot of the stories have a Shiite vocabulary. You wouldn't read these stories, you wouldn't read some of these sentences coming out of uh, uh, another place, another place, you see. So it's very interesting. I thought about all of these things and how they vary. And then there's the issue of war. There's the issue of how uh, war and revolution is a background to many of these stories, you know, how that plays itself out. And, you know, you're not really going to have that And the regime in itself. And the regime itself. And the regime itself is a player in all of this, as opposed to, let's say, as opposed, as opposed to, let's say, mobsters in the classical sense, uh, um, you have a different kind of a mobster here, but it's all there. Oh. Last <laughs> week we had um, a group of Burmese writers here. And they were also talking about um, self-censorship. And part of it had to do with the nature of the language. And some of them had decided to use English because they felt they could be more direct, mm -hmm. that the language itself had an effect. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could comment. And I'm wondering, you've written in English. Mm -hmm. Did your writers write in? You wrote, they wrote in, in Persian. Uh, Persian, and then you translated it. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering about the difference in language and how that affects, given what you were just saying. Oh, it has a tremendous, tremendous effect. Uh, Persian is, a, is an amazing language, and I think one of our issues is that the Persian classical tradition is one of those it's not as monumental as, let's say, the Chinese, but it's right up there amongst the... What? Uh, well, <laughs> Speak <is>. for yourself. <laughs> it's, you know, it's uh, up there amongst the half dozen, like, truly monumental traditions of the, of the world. And, uh, and, but I think uh, because of various reasons I can't get into, it, it doesn't have the vocabulary for this, for, let's say, a noir, noir storytelling. And also because the English language is just, is a really, is a, there's a plethora of words for ev every little thing. But, um, so uh, it makes it difficult. It makes it difficult. And then where verbs fall, mm -hmm. where verbs fall, and all of that stuff. Uh, and I had to, I had to think about this hard because at the same time Persian, you know, but in the la in the end of towards the end of the nineteenth century, one of the most you know Omar Khayyam became the most important, the most influential poet of uh, of uh, the English language. I mean, Ezra Pound named his son Omar, and you know the 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 influence that uh, Persian poetry had on English. Uh, English uh, literature is profound. It's argu not even arguably mm, the Omar translations became uh, the greatest translation from any language to English. It became a part of the English language. In the past quarter century, the same thing happened with Persian again, with Rumi. Again, another Persian writer became the most influential poet in the English language. 
So we have that. We have that. But at the same time, we have a dearth of vocabulary for this, for this sort of gritty realism that I talk about that goes beyond just, uh, goes beyond the uh, issues that we talked about. Nevertheless, um, I don't know how to explain this. I think it's something that, you know, I, it has to be worked book by book, story by story. It's such a hard, what I did here, and I, I hope I've succeeded, it's such a hard process that I had to work with each writer, like for months, it had to go back and forth and back and forth because they really are not used, they really are not used to this language. And I, what I call this is the language of truth in a way that's different than the language of truth of Rumi and Chayyam. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. <laughs> Yes, yeah. translation, yeah, yeah, I think about it all the time. Yeah. I just finished uh, The Whitest Set of Teeth in Tehran. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a relentless river of bitterness until the moment Lotfi picks, picks up the child. There's all that humanity. And then uh, she bashes his head in. Uh, all that darkness and then a sudden burst of light. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say something about that story and particularly about the ending. Uh, yeah, Lot, that's my own story in the Tehran Noir. Um, um, uh, I wanted to again write a classical noir story. Lotfi is not a likable character to me. He is a character who is full of bitterness. He is full of anger. And uh, he is a guy who's lived in America, but he's gone back to Iran. And uh, he lives across a synagogue, but that's <laughs> not me. <laughs> and um, he. You know, he goes back, it goes back actually to a lot of things Roya has talked to me about before and talked to me tonight. He goes back to Iran for a lot of things, but one thing he goes back to is revenge. He goes back to for revenge. And every time he comes to take revenge, something happens that sort of uh, takes him out of, you know, detours him from that. And, you know, he's against this person and that person. and and uh, he does not take revenge. And actually, in the classic noir sense, because he doesn't take revenge, at the, at the end, he becomes uh, the sacrifice. I won't give the story away, but... Um, so the ending is actually... I wanted an ending that's classical noir, where, you know, this guy actually tried to be good despite himself, and again, he failed. Even, even in his goodness, he failed, let alone in his badness. So I don't know if that's, yeah, that's, that was the story. Yeah. Why did she say with you? I, one other language, I'm stuck right here. <laughs> one other language that Persian has influenced is the Urdu language. And yeah. A lot of what you're saying today reminds me of Ismat Chukta and Manto, who were tried during uh, pre-independence India for indecency, dealing with relationships of lesbianism in their books. Mm. When India was partitioned, a lot of the Muslim writers who wrote in Urdu um, and who were torn about their identity but had to flee to Pakistan, one of the devices that they used to circumvent censorship was actually nationalism. Mm. And you find uh, some of the most profound Pakistani poets who've used very controversial nationalist metaphors mm. to actually circumvent the censorship itself. So are there any writers that 
that you can speak of, are there any devices where they are subversively countering the censorship? Or is it a little more pessimistic than that right now? Uh, it's a very... Um, first of all, I think it's important to, to just mention that uh, uh, prose writing is, uh, or fiction writing is uh, quite a new genre for Iran. Uh, that despite the fact that uh, poetry writing has had uh, centuries and centuries of history behind it, um, uh, fiction writing uh, and then, in addition to that, nonfiction writing uh, are both new, uh, which, which means that we are, we are still learning uh, how to do it, how to put stories together. Um, but, but also, I think, um, uh, Salar uh, talked about a lack of vocabulary for writing noir, which, which uh, I believe plays a part. But I think the, the other problem is that uh, there are certain ways in which um, writing prose is profoundly different from writing poetry. And, and part of the problem in, in Persian prose writing is that we approach prose writing in the same way that we approach poetic writing. Um, that means that uh, we, we think that metaphors, uh, ambiguous language, um, similes, all, all the things that we use basically as, as uh, tools to create beautiful poetry would work in prose. And in fact, it does the opposite. Because, because we read prose for entirely different reasons than, than we read poetry. And, but unfortunately, as Iranians, we oftentimes approach prose with the same tools and the same thinking. Um, so, so how do writers uh, and artists in general, because I think uh, maybe some of you uh, or all of you would appreciate this. I, I asked this question uh, or witness other people ask this question from Abbas Kiarostami, the Iranian filmmaker. You know, why do you make movies only about children? And one of the best answers I ever heard him give was that because I can't comfortably make movies about adult life in Iran uh, without lying. Um, and so, you know, I can't show a woman in a house without her head covered, and we practically have no women covering their heads when they are in their own household with their husbands and children. Um, so I would be li lying to my audiences if I portrayed women that way. So I try to put that aside because I want to be honest, and, and so I make movies about children, or at least at, at the time he was, uh, he was involved in, in um, having... Uh, kids as, as his uh, main characters. Um, and I think writers do oftentimes uh, use some of the same tools uh, of poetry. They, they become incredibly ambiguous. And, or as Salar very wonderfully puts, puts in, the me in, in the introduction, uh, we use fuzzy language and, and we think that we're circumventing uh, the censors. We're not circumventing censors. We, um, we have, we double speak. And so on one hand, it's very satisfying because uh, we have created certain euphemisms that have become code language that we Iranians understand. For instance, you will never catch an Iranian talk about the regime as the regime. Uh, we, we refer to them as they. So whenever in, in Persian conversation you say they, nobody will ever doubt who the they is. So, so we've created euphemisms, and, and it's very satisfying as readers because we, uh, we know the code and we love decoding the code. Um, but on the other hand, it's not exactly literature because, we, because uh, it, in a way we are event we're, we're uh, caught up in the process of uh, taking revenge on our censors, on, on the regime, rather than creating literature. And I think, um, again, I think he, he refers to it. He really sums it up um, wonderfully in the introduction. Um, and, and I think uh, part of what we don't do is that we don't engage, in other words, in, in issues such as nationalism, because um, I think all in all, we have somewhat become, as a nation, being Iranian, uh, disillusioned in literature because literature had such a holy and revered place prior to the revolution that, that many writers and poets were, in fact, the leaders of, this, of the secular Iranian revolution. And once the revolution failed at delivering what it was supposed to, it was as if literature failed. 
Um, and to some degree, I think that was a blessing for other arts, that, that a lot of the visual arts and, and non-literary arts have uh, blossomed in the past 35 years. Uh, but literature has been somewhat stagnant, and I think that's in part due to the 1979 disillusionment. I can add a couple of things about that. Uh, first of all, the 79 revolution, as Roya very nicely puts it, it really created a chasm, a divide, because there was a generation that was uh, very knowledgeable with the classics, and but they also knew that traditions, the literature of the West very well, and they were, they were a good bridge uh, to sort of carry us through and the new generations through. Uh, and they became very disillusioned, and, uh, and they sort of uh, pulled themselves out of the running. So there was that. The other thing is, we do actually have an incredible tradition of prose as well, particularly in the histories, like the history of Beihaqi. We have blueprints for excellent prose in, in Iran. The trouble is that a lot of writers don't really know their own tradition very well, and that works against them. And that happens in fiction. Hmm? Beihaqi is not fiction. Yeah, it's, but referring. it's prose, though. Yeah. You know, so there is that. Three, about nationalism, Pakistan's case is, is a very specific case. It has to do with the partition, and uh, it's too long to get into, but it's a very different case than Iran's case. Uh, but, you know, interestingly about Pakistan and the subcontinent, uh, you know, when, when language becomes Baroque, when language becomes bro, uh, it, for several hundred years, the, the literary language of the subcontinent was Persian, and we call it the Indian style, Sapke Hindi. And these writers, these poets, like Bidel uh, of Delhi uh, or Erbal uh, of Lahore, they wrote in Persian. Uh, Indian writers who wrote in Persian. And it's a very, uh, it can be incredible, but it's very Baroque, sometimes very hard to understand. And uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think, I think it's the moment when, when uh, language and uh, uh, writing uh, makes that shift, makes that shift, like it did in India. In, during the Mughal era with Persian, before the British came. And uh, then you try to say things, you try to say things like you're trying to put food in your mouth, you know, like this. Sometimes it works actually beautifully, but sometimes it doesn't. And uh, I think sometimes with our Persian writers of today, um, we're doing that uh, in not the best sense of the term. Yeah. All right. thank, you. So thank you very much. Uh, I feel like um, we've probably started uh, several hour-long conversations that we were uh, tempted to s continue. And uh, we may not have hours, but we do have uh, a chance to get the books, and at least we have minutes. So we may as well uh, take advantage of that. Um, if you have been intrigued, do pick up a book. And um, please join me again in, in giving a big hand to our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>